Hello and welcome, everybody, to your talking over me. As always, I'm your host, Adam Patrick, and today I welcome Corey from focusseeds.com to the show. That's P H O C U S seeds.com. Corey is involved, of course, in the Mises Caucus, and his background is in the horticulture and farming industry. He also runs Focus Seeds, obviously, his small seed company where he works with uh, vegetable and herb seeds and also works with a cannabis company to produce uh, different varietals of CBD in the greenhouse and operations departments. And we'll get into that in the first couple of minutes of the show. But what I really loved about this is uh, Corey is definitely a liberty-minded human being and obviously working within the Mises Caucus here in Connecticut, you're going to you're going to have to be. But what he's doing is um, creating, and that's been a huge focus of the second half of this past year on this show, is creating the reality that you want to see by helping people to create for themselves. And so I thought it was really fun talking to him. We spent a little bit more time than I'd anticipated talking about our religious upbringing and our religious background as far as organized religion goes. And I kind of wanted to run with that because I thought that was super interesting and really played into the second half of the show, which is the creation and helping people create part. So I think you're going to get a shitload out of the show. I really enjoyed it. I hope that you do too. If you do, which I know you will, please go ahead and share the show with your friends and loved ones. Do not share it with stupid people. We do not want stupid people listening to the show. So do not try to win arguments by sharing my show with stupid people. You can do that on social media. That is not my job. If you think people are going to enjoy and find value in this content that I'm providing and my guests are providing, go ahead and uh, and share it. Of course, I'll leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. I would greatly appreciate it. Of course, I'm available on literally every other relevant podcatcher. Uh, we are on YouTube. I know a lot of people don't watch YouTube without video. Eventually, when I have the time, I will put some video up there and people will probably want to watch that. So that will be <laughs> a lot of fun too. But um, but uh, that's enough for me. Let's get into it with Corey from focusseeds.com. All right, man. So fuck, how have you been? Good, good. Working a lot. It's been it's a busy, busy spring, always busy in spring. So, well, g- get into yeah. some of that. T- tell me why. Tell me a little bit about your, your background in the industry that you're in, why you got into it. And, um, and then of course, springtime seems like it would be busy for what you do. So yeah, g- get into a little bit of that. Okay. Yeah. So I work in the horticulture and farming industry. I get, um, I've been, I've been in the industry for like 10 years now. What I mainly do is I have my own uh, small seed company. I do vegetable and herb seeds. Um, I also work in the cannabis industry. I work for a hemp company. Um, so we do mainly uh, CBD. Um, mm. And I kind of do the handle a lot of the um, plant breeding and kind of greenhouse operations part of it. Um, then I also do some... Uh, landscape maintenance type stuff for a company that does a uh, high-end uh, estate gardening um, in Litchfield County, which is interesting to say the least. So what made you want to get into that industry? Was it just seeing an opening or were you already sort of focused on, I, I guess, nature? Is that is that a good way to say it? Because you were already doing like landscaping and you're outside and you wanted to kind of work with what you already knew and expand it? Or did, did you see something within you know, the individual liberty, economic freedom community, where there was an angle there to not just contribute, but create value. Okay. Well, yeah, if you want me to start from the beginning, I yeah, can. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's going to be yeah, really yeah. interesting. I, I'll, I'll tell you why I find this interesting too, it, because I, I've talked a lot on this show about how, you know, libertarian theory gets no one anywhere except into a bookstore. And when folks are out there creating the world that they want to see or contributing to society in a, in a way that, 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 um, shares value or contributes value, then we're actually living our principles 
And that's way more important than just fucking pontificating about them all the time. So, yeah, I'm, I'm actually really curious. And I think the audience will be incredibly curious as to how somebody gets into something like this and and will translate into why I think we both feel it's so important to do. Yeah, well, I, that's actually a good, good way to start it because I got into what I do mainly because of the fact that I wanted to actually like do something. I wanted solutions. I wanted, I, I'm a boots on the ground kind of guy. And for me, like, I mean, that's, that's where this all comes from. Um, I guess philosophically, I came from more of like a left anarchist um, philosophy. So reading a lot of like John Zerzin and Mur Murray Bookchan and like Noam Chomsky and stuff like that. In time going through a lot of uh, questioning of religion and stuff. And um, I guess finding, finding the Orthodox Church and Christ and all that. And so I, where that all kind of centered me was, what do I do with my life? What, what, what is the purpose of, I guess, not only my existence, but what, what do we as humans do? And when you get down to it, we grow plants, we live in God's creation, and that's all we can really do. So instead of, yeah, instead of doing the philosophy route, I was like, well, I'm going to grow plants. Um, to me, that seemed like the most logical um, option. And I started, I started from there. So I, I, one day I was like, well, if I'm going to actually do this, um, and I grew up on a, on a kind of a small hobby farm and stuff. And my family had a background in that. I was like, uh, I was in my early twenties. I was living in an apartment in a city. Um, even though I lived most of my life in a more rural area, it was the first year I'd ever lived in a city and I hated it. And I, I sat down I was like, well, I'm going to read this book on horticulture a textbook from cover to cover. If I can do that and grow some beans on my, uh, on my balcony, then I'm, I'm going to do this. And, uh, yeah. And that took me down kind of this road. You, so you, from there, uh, yeah. You, uh, you talked to for a second there about, uh, the Orthodox Christian tradition. Was that something that you grew up in or something that you found later? No, no. Yeah. I, I converted when I was in my early, mm. uh, early twenties, mm. but I, uh, yeah. F from that's, what? That's, yeah. Uh, well I was, I was raised like kind of, you know, vaguely, uh, Protestant. Mm. So and then I, I, I was, a I was an vehement atheist for maybe like, I don't know, five, six years. And then I was, I decided one day I was going to read the whole Bible to refute all, everything all the religious people had to say. And <laughs> I got, I think I got halfway through the New Testament. And I was like, well, I guess I'm a Christian now. So, uh, so much for that. But that's, yeah, that's another story. Well, one of the things, um, you know, for, for me, libertarianism, the, the way that we would interpret it now in 2021, or probably for the last like 50 years, assuming that it started with Rothbard, right? Modern libertarian thinking is... Um, so, so much a product of Christianity that you can't really have one without the other, uh, at, le at least the way I've, I've come to understand it over the 20 or so years I've been sort of fighting my own personal atheism. And I, I find that there's something about the Orthodox church where it, so I, I came up Roman Catholic myself and the the dichotomy between those two things and probably the reason they've warred so much over time, or, or maybe the reason that the Orthodox Church survived the Dark Ages so profoundly was that they were less concerned with the vessel as, as opposed to what's inside of it. And for me, Roman Catholicism was very concerned with the vessel, was very concerned with the system, with the order, with the humans, with the tra you know, tradition is one thing. But for the Orthodox tradition, it seemed to me that they were much more concerned with what is inside the vessel, with the message itself. And that for me has always resonated as a, as I moved from libertarianism into even like post libertarianism and, and really found like a connection to uh, spirituality and mysticism that if I was going to stay within Christian doctrine or Christian tradition, I don't know if there's, I suppose there's some sects of Protestantism that would work for me, but if I'm going the traditional route, I, I don't think there's anything that even compares to what the Orthodox church has been, has been, um, kind of holding fast to over all these years yeah um 
I guess I kind of agree with you, but I think it goes a little bit deeper with that. Mm. Uh, in orthodoxy, there's this this grounding in mysticism and almost this like it, it doesn't really matter and you don't need to know why. Um, Catholicism mm. especially is very it was is it was very interested in the why and with the legal arguments and orthodoxy doesn't it doesn't care. It doesn't matter that that's not the point. The point of Christ is not for you to understand how it works or why it works that I guess the point is for you just to, to live that as best as you can, which is another difference too. Um, I think Catholicism Catholicism gets <clears throat> very hooked up on, you know, legal tenets. Like this is what you're supposed to do as a Catholic where Orthodoxy specifically sin is taught as you, you're an archer shooting mm, the arrow missing the mark at the target and you, you sometime you're gonna yeah. miss the mark you yeah. can be the best archer in the world and you're gonna have that one off day mm-hmm. um and so i i think for me when when i started you know when i started reading the bible I was, that that's the first thing i went to was the protestant church because that's where i grew up and um looked at evangelical churches and i was just so turned off and so i was like well let me let me learn the history of this let me go back let, let me see where where this all came from and then that's where I, I didn't even know the Orthodox church existed. I thought the Catholic church was like the, you know, it's the original church or whatever. And then you're like, oh, well, there's the entire other half of entire Christendom that uh, spans India and Asia and, you know, not Rome and, and really the Western, what we consider, you know, the West. Um, yeah. And, and so that tradition has been alive since, since day one. Yeah. I, I've been doing a, um, kind of a mini series within the show with my friend, Chris Manis, where we, we've been going back and talking about the Bible from a, a very foundational historical point of view with, with the goal that eventually we're going to get to the new Testament and really kind of bring all of these ideas together. But it, when I set out to do it, as somebody who you know is, is not nearly as devout a believer as Chris is, it, the goal was let's talk about this in historical context. Let's look at what these people were trying to do to survive at this time, and why are they telling the stories the way they're telling them? Why are they? Why is why has God chosen these particular groups of people or these particular human beings for His message when they all seem flawed? And I mean, flawed to the point of being like decrepit human beings for the most part until they they find their way. And, you know, a lot of atheists will, will look at the Old Testament specifically and they'll be like, it's full of rape and murder and incest. And, and you're like, yeah, yeah, kind of. Like, yeah, it is. But that's not our world. Like they, they're not well, existing in the world that we live in. And, and, and by, by Christ coming to the – coming down to earth – Right. There's a reconciliation of all of that, like that people no longer have to, you know, pastorally, nomadically fend for themselves in, you know, five, six thousand years ago that there's a there's a better path. I feel like the Orthodox Church does a very good job of holding true to that message of whereas, you know, Protestantism, I think it's great that that Calvin and Luther existed because they broke apart a lot of the same things that like Christ would have gone into the temple with the money changers and broke up. You know, I think that was very important kind of set like a stage for uh, different Protestant sects. Um, talking about your personal relationship with the most high. I think some of that is important, but Chris and I have also talked about how, talked about how that's been incredibly corrupted. There's something about the beauty of the, the traditional message within the Orthodox church and the fact that it, it also kind of understands systems and hierarchies are important for tradition and society, but your own personal connection with the most high is really what the goal is. Would you think that's kind of a good summation? Yeah. And I can go a bunch of different ways with like all with everything you just said. Um, go for it. I guess the, the first part too, like about the old Testament, it's like, yeah, cause that's how humanity was back then. So mm-hmm to expect that there wasn't murder and rape and brutality and, and all those horrible things is kind of like, well, you know, the human life has been pretty brutal since its existence. And to just be like, well, if it's in the Bible, it should be good. And everyone's perfect is like, well, okay, that's not what it is anyways. So why would you assume that? And then I guess going, I, I just kind of lost my train of thought. 
but the the, the, the last comment what was your last comment um about finding like, like the orthodox tradition finding a balance between tradition and culture and also oh. bringing in your your personal connection with the most high yeah yeah and and i know i i you mentioned hierarchy in there too which i think is super interesting um yeah because i think from like an anarchist or or i guess you would say libertarian tradition what you know you would say like oh like hierarchy is bad but i see that as like well no i think we it's have, great yeah yeah we have yeah. spontaneous hi- hierarchy yeah. we have voluntary yeah. hierarchy and that and that that is good because you are you are part of that you you know you have a different say in a say voluntary um or spontaneous hierarchy than you do in in some type of legalistic or imposed which is way different than, you know, what we have with the state. And I think people miss that nuance, you know, completely where, you you know, like I I see this where like atheists will hate priests because they're authority figures who are like, you have to consent to them being an authority figure, but then we'll love a politician and you have no consent over them being Mm -hmm. a politician over you. And to me, that's like, okay, well, you know, you, you, you're kind of, you, you're missing it, you know, like it does, it, that doesn't make any sense. So. Right. And, and the same atheists, especially the new atheists, right? Like the Dawson's, the Harris's of the world, right? That they, they would of course embrace hierarchy in their own social order, right? In their own lives. Yeah. They understand how it works. Really what they're not they're they would tell you that they're arguing against hierarchy, but what they're really doing is just finding anything associated with religion and just saying no. And to me, that's a bad argument, right? It, it's, well, I can't see it. I can't feel it. You can't prove it. Therefore, it doesn't exist. And you're like, yeah, but like those ideas exist, right? Sure. Like even if like, for example, I, I've been watching the, the the slow and steady mental and emotional decline of Jordan Peterson over the last five to six years. And uh, I, I think, you know, you could look at Dawkins or Harris or Hitchens or any of these people kind of the same way. I think Jordan Peterson is way more intelligent than all of those people combined. But if you like, like Jordan Peterson, for example, specifically said no, right? He talked about having a calling. Like he actually was visited by the Holy Spirit. He talks about this and he said no. And that's incredible because right after that happened, everything fell apart for him. Like everything fell apart for him and he's broken down on air on podcasts crying about how he couldn't do it. He just couldn't do it. He, he wanted to do it, but he couldn't do it. And you're watching it break him and you're like, dude, you, you're a, you're a biblical historian. You get this. Just embrace it, dude. Like I haven't been visited. I don't think at least not to that extent. And I'm open to this shit, right? Like, I'm like, come visit me whenever you want. And, well, and, and well, he had this experience uh, yeah. and he was like, no, he's like, no, I don't want to do it. And you're like, ah, <laughs> why are you doing this to yourself? And, and yeah, so it's, uh, it's very interesting. The, the atheist like ruin that they, they'll bring on themselves, but they also, if they're not willing to at least embrace hierarchy within society, they're also bringing ruin upon people around them because without structure, without order, without law, right, there is no society. And we're watching the remnants of that right now when people lose their way and they don't have the, the the totality of meaning and purpose within their selves, within their soul, within their heart. You're seeing that play out over the last year. You're seeing what happens when people are just starving, starving for meaning and purpose. And they'll latch on to social distancing or Anthony Fauci. Like they just need it. It's like biologically, mimetically, and genetically programmed in us to find that somewhere. And um, this is the this, this is what the atheists wanted. What's happening this year is what they asked for. Yeah, well, well, everyone has a religion. You know, mm-hmm. religion is just a way of life. And it's kind of like, you know, what do you, you know, it's what you do with that. Mm-hmm. So anyone who says they're not religious, uh, to me, that just, when I hear that, I'm just like, okay, well, you just don't know. You don't know what you're, you don't know what that means. So, okay. And then I, you know, I try to like figure out like, so what is their religion without them having to mm-hmm. explicitly tell me what organized religion they're a part of? Um, I'm not too familiar with, I mean, I know who Jordan Peterson is, but I, I'm not familiar like what, what he's doing now or whatever. But um, to me, that's really interesting um, because I feel like, you know, everyone is called, um, which is part of it. And the, and the other thing too is 
there's one sin that Christ said was unforgivable and that's blasphemy of the Holy spirit. And so to me, that's like, if the Holy spirit comes to you and you say no, Mm. like that's what he's talking about. And it's like, that's the one thing he can't forgive unless you like say, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's also my understanding about how God works. Like if you want to be far away from God, you'll be far away from God and that'll be horrible. You know, and that's that, you know, but if you want to be close, that'll be great. And that's kind of how I see heaven and hell or death. Um, I mean, you, you kind of like, that's, that's the state you're going to be in. If you hate other people, if you hate God, then being, being dead is going to be a really long, horrible experience um, because that's all you're going to experience is going back to <laughs> every other thing and, you know, you know, piece of existence that's ever been, you're going to be with that. And in a totally different state than you are now, and so, yeah, that, if 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 that makes sense, it, but, it, um, it does. And I mean, like I said, you you can see it playing out in the world right now that we live in. You can see what happens when people are devoid of accepting something bigger than them into themselves. And it's one of the reasons I've latched so much on to the dim age and what Ben Armani's been talking about for the last. God, it's got to be 15, 16 months now and, and why I've delved so far into it because it just makes so much sense to me, right? It, it, I, I wasn't a convert to what he was talking about. That that was what I already felt. And I just found somebody who was articulating it so much better than I could have and, and saw the cycles and patterns the same way I was seeing them but could say it in a way that made more sense than the way it was jumbled up in my head. And You know, kind of like you were getting to, everybody has a religion, right? Everybody has something that they put over themselves. It could be the state. It could be Anthony Fauci. It could be God. It could be, I don't know, uh, stock car racing, right? But everybody has something. Like we were saying, we're wired for that. And and so all you have to do if you want to see what works and what doesn't work in reality is go back and look at the cycles and patterns of ancient traditions, of ancient histories, of the ancients themselves, and, and look at what, ha- what, has, what has led them to survive while this Western democratic culture that we've created that's only been around for, let's say, after the Enlightenment, like 300 years, you know, 400 years when the concept started, uh, <clears throat> And seeing how that's deteriorated while these cultures uh, outside of that tradition have lasted thousands and thousands of years. And why have they lasted and this one is slowly uh, collapsing and, and, and ending up in ruin? Well, it's pretty obvious, I think, to me, why they, they'll last and we won't. Well, not that you and I won't. We'll be fine. But this particular Western democratic Republican idea of individual liberty and economic freedom is you know, idea-wise – something worth looking at, but how it was implemented was just so, oh my God, it was just so painfully bad and inclusive. I think being inclusive was one of the things that really destroyed it. Yeah. Go, go to Mount Athos and ask them if there are any women there and what, and uh, what the time, what time change is and what year it is and who's president of the United States, bro. Cause you'll trust me, the response you get will probably be not what you're expecting at all. Mm. Um <laughs> But, but anyways, back to your saying about, uh, I, I listened to your podcast with Minor Armani and I found it pretty, uh, that was, that was pretty interesting. Um, one of, one of the things I always thought was pretty, you know, telling is, you know, like you have these apostles, um, and they can speak multiple languages. They can do math. Uh, they have actual life skills like fishing. They can survive in the wilderness for long periods of times. Um, most of them owned weapons and they knew how to use them. You know, they helped, I had families, they had societies and like, we, you know, we look at them and be like, ah, oh, it's crazy. You know, what are these, these, like, basically we look at them like Neanderthals, like, oh, uh, well not, not we, but yeah, you know, right, right, right. But from our modern people in that modern part of you, like, oh, look, they believed in miracles. These guys are idiots. It's like, yeah, I guess, I guess they were dumb. How many languages do you speak? How much math do you do on a daily basis? You go, go, like, yeah, go sail a boat and bring in some fish, dude. Just go, go in the wilderness for forty days and come back and see, mm. you know, see how you feel. Well, that's a great oh. point that'll <laughs> you kind of lead into, I think, what what you're doing with your business, which is, you know, when when we cycle out as a culture, when we cycle out of a material age into a mystical age. 
what you will find is um, people don't understand how the technology around them works, right? It would be a, a good analogy for the listeners is like the Lord of the Rings, which I, I just started re rewatching. Uh, I mean, I've read the books, but it's time wise, it's easier for me to watch the watch the movies, the extended cuts. But you look at something like the Rings, right? And those are just the technology. They're no different of a technology than the computer or the cell phone or the microphone or the mixers that we're using right now to, you know, uh, transport our images and our voice over l incredibly long distances to contribute to somebody's listening pleasure, right? If, if somebody, you know, if we were to be wiped out by a bomb today and somebody were to pick up the artifacts of this, you know, a hundred years from now, they wouldn't probably understand what the, they probably worship the cell phone. Right. They'd, they'd make it like some golden calf because they wouldn't understand what it was. So, you know, magic for me is just technology that we don't understand. And when you when you have not allowed yourself to get to the point where the technology that you're using is something that you don't understand, you've held true to the way. So these indigenous cultures, these traditional cultures, you know, to, to maybe bring it home to a group of people that the listeners might be. Uh, very familiar with the Amish people, for example, if you go to an Amish community and you watch, you know, something that they use break, well, they're, if they can't fix that technology themselves, they're one person removed from somebody who can, right? That there is everything there is functional. It's fixable. They understand how it works. They could recreate it. And yet in, in this material world, we don't even really know what happens to our shit when we flush it down the toilet. We're like, no, it's just, poof, pew, it's gone. It's magic. It's gone. We don't. And it, it, and you know, as, as Vin has said on numerous podcasts before, it, back in the, back in the day, back in traditional or ancient cultures, if you didn't know where that shit went, you would die. You had to know what happened to that shit. You had to know, or you'd be dead. Right. And that's, I think what I'm trying to help vocalize to the listeners is, this healthy balance between the material and the mystical and finding your way and finding your purpose and holding true to the good parts of tradition while also embracing the massive benefits that modern technology can bring to communication and uh, alleviating suffering. So yeah, to kind of bring that all home, I think what really fascinated me about what you're doing it, it, you're kind of doing the same thing, right? That the technology of planting and growing and nursing, you know, fruits, vegetables, wh whatever needs to, you know, needs to be uh, sustainable for culture. That's like going back to a technology that needs to be understood. And that's what makes me so interested to hear about kind of how you got into it and, and why you're doing it. Because it's, you know, that's the type of thing that if we, if we lose that technology, we're all going to die because not everybody's going to be able to go to the grocery store when the grid's been down for two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, that gets right back into the whole plant thing. It's, it's really about like observation really. Um, you know, more people need to just like when you're driving down the highway, look at what trees are in flower, you know, look at, look at when leaves come out, look at like, Look at what, when you see this bug or that you see this bird, what time of year and, and really, you know, take note of that and, and just learn it too. It's weird. Like when I started getting into plants, I think I was like, I must've been like 22 or so when I really had this one day and it was after like one of my, one of my horticulture classes. And like I said, I grew up on a farm, but like I was driving down the highway and I'm like, huh, all these maple trees, all these red maples right about this time of year. Um, you know, early, early, mid April, like I, I can see all the buds. I can see all the flowers opening and I'm driving on the highway and I'm like, okay, this is crazy. Like I know what all these trees, are. I know the species of trees. I can see them for miles. I know all of them. And now like every year it's just like, Oh yeah, the maples are, are blooming now. Now I know that it's, you know, we got like, you know, another four, six weeks till frost date and, and all this, you know what I mean? I know, I know these birds, you know, I know blue jays are going to come back. You know, there's going to be more of this, you know, you know, I'll look on the snow maybe like a, a month ago and I'll see a bunch of springtail insects hopping around. I'm like, okay, all right. You know, I know, I know how the season, you know, I know when it's going to start and yeah, it's just crazy. It's, 
like you, you, I mean, it's nice to have time. It's nice to have a phone, you know, it's nice to have a calculator, but it, it's always really, it's, I don't know. It's, it's hope to look at the snow and see this like insect hopping around and be like, mm. all right, you know, we're okay. It's, it's that time of year again. And and it's like, you don't, you don't really need those other things if, if they weren't here. It's, so. it's beautiful for me to hear that in two ways. Well, for, first off, it, it sticks to technology, right? Because when you understand the cycles and the patterns of nature, you understand how to maneuver yourself to survive within the hard times, right? If, if you know which plants are coming up at certain uh, intervals or, or you know um, which insects show up at certain times of the year or e even it's something as simple as how the stars move or how the wind blows, like, like there's so much to this that if you really understand that, you can alleviate so much hurt and pain in your own life, right? And, and then there's the, the sort of the metaphysical or the mystical part of it where when you're that in tune with nature, there's something about how you are – your mind and your body and your spirit work that just works better. You just feel better when you're, when you're tuned in with the world around you. I think it's something like the Native Americans or any Native tribe understands through their own rituals and practices, right? Their own traditions that when you, when you tune into to nature, when you turn, tune into the spiritual realm, there's something in you that just is imbued with a certain type of peace. And that seems to transcend all cultures at all times throughout all of history. And when you see the cycle and pattern play out that way, it's impossible to ignore how important it must be for us. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and I've seen it the other way too, where um, like, I think this is also, and I'm, I'm going to kind of counter where you just said a little bit. I think this is one of the reasons why, like farming and, and horticulture and these jobs are so frustrating and they're still like so stressful, especially in the era we, we live in is because of like, yeah, you have this great, you know, connection to nature, but on the other end, like when something bad happens, like when you get a hailstorm that's like a little bit later, you get drought, it's like all your work is gone. Mm -hmm. You have this, all this insect damage and, and it's like, that's it. And like, what do you do? And you feel so helpless. And like, it's, it's just crazy how you can, you know, I, I hear a lot of people, you know, and, and you're right what you say, but like, I, I, there's just such a romanticism of, of kind of like farming and gardening and like mm. people want to go out into the woods and homestead, but it's like, it, it's still brutal. It's, there's a reason why most farmers are in debt and, you know, alcoholics and, <laughs> you know. And I, and, you know, I have my, I, I have my struggles too. You know what I mean? I'm not some like, <laughs> you know, hippie guru living up in the, <laughs> well, well, you know, do, do on you, some homestead. Do you find that, that one of the reasons for that could be how, you know, let's go all the way up the ladder. Let's go to like a M Monsanto or one of those like large corporate agriculture companies, like multinational corporations. And clearly at that level, they're not in tune with nature. I'm sure they have scientists and biologists and evolutionary biologists who are out there, uh, you know, uh, studying cycles and patterns for the purpose of contributing data that then the board makes decisions on. But they're not – by doing that, yes, they're, they're like uh, hacking in to the cycles and patterns, but they're not really appreciating them for what they are. And so you can go all the way down to like – let's say I were to go – uh, forage for mushrooms in in the woods that I'm going to use for like a pizza restaurant down the road or something, or forage for ramps, which is a big thing in Southern Connecticut, right? Every yep, ramp right, season, right now, right. yeah, <clears throat> right. right. So now, you're familiar man. with that. <laughs> so there, there it, but in the middle, there's this like um, small business farmer, and being in the restaurant industry for the last 16 years, and uh, 12 of them here in Connecticut, I've done a lot of work with local what we call local farms. But there, I, I think a lot of people wouldn't realize how much larger those local farms are than they would than they might think right how they would re so but they're not as large as monsanto so there has to be i think some sort of balance between clearly you want to continue your operation because you want to provide wealth power and influence for your for your family and your loved ones you want to contribute to your community and you don't want to fail as a business so at, at what point do you think 
the the system gets corrupted? At what point do you think people lose their way uh, where, you know, the person foraging for mushrooms to sell to the – or the uh, ramps to sell to the restaurant down the street and then Monsanto? At what point in the middle do people lose their way? I don't know. That's hard. It's hard for me to say. Honestly, like I, I've – I've listened a lot to people who, who work at Monsanto and I don't know if you have listened. Have you listened to any of the great race that are like the Davos podcast oh, yeah. and stuff oh, yeah. like that? Almost, yeah, all, yeah. Of it. almost I, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. I've listened. Not, I wouldn't say I, I've listened to almost, but like a good, yeah, I've, I've had some, and, and it's like, it's, it's so hard for me. Cause it's like, I don't, it's like, it's like they buy what they say and it's, I can't, it's weird. I can't put my finger on it. It's like, I know this is weird and it's wrong, but it's almost like, uh, I don't know. I can't, I, I feel like we need new words. And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> words in 2021 to... <laughs> don't mean anything. So you can just invent new ones and make them mean whatever you want. It's uh, that yeah, apparently that's I, how I it think, works. I now. think, I don't know. I think, I think the cathedral is actually a good, a good one that our, our mm. kind of circles use, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's weird, man. It really is. I, I think those people who are in those positions, I, and I'm talking about my, you know, Monsanto or, or somebody in the biotech industry that's high up, they really think they're doing good. Mm. Um, and I don't necessarily disagree with, and I know this might offend some people. I don't necessarily disagree with a lot of what they have to say. Um, I'm not somebody who looks like t- people don't understand GMOs. They just see non GMO and that's good. And it's like, all right, well, there's also like, I don't know when you, I mean, it's hard for me to, t- you know, talk. I feel like if people aren't in, in the industry, they don't understand some of this, but like, you know, you can do gene marker tracing and, and it's not, it's not a genetically modified, you know, organism, but you're still tracing genes and tracking genes and using that for breeding. Um, but you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I honestly don't know where that line is to tell you the truth. I, I'm going to pull something there's... up here on, um, <clears throat> I'm going to pull something up here on Facebook. If I can just scroll real quick. And, uh, somebody I, I care about and love very much, put it up. So this was the post, right? PepsiCo who owns naked naked's like a juice smoothie company, right? Yeah. Settled a $9 million lawsuit over them claiming their naked drinks were all natural. They actually were found to have a bunch of nasty chemicals in them, including formaldehyde, uh, in parentheses, a neurotoxin. That's not true, but that's me adding. And Fibersol 2, a soluble GMO corn fiber that acts as a low-calorie bulking agent. Artificial ingredients like calcium pentathenate, which is (laughs) uh, synthetically produced from, yep, formaldehyde. Get this, they never recalled the drinks off the shelves. They never reformulated. Want to know what they did in compliance with the lawsuit? They had to remove the word, quote unquote, natural from the label. It's still the same toxic concoction as before. And I looked at that and I went, no, nope, nope. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. It doesn't make, I've, first of all, I've heard those words before, but the sentiment just felt wrong. So I take a crap load of self, uh, uh, supplements and one of them, I actually happen to take. So I, I went online and I just looked it up and this is on a break at work. And I put calcium pentathenate is a calcium salt of B5. It can be taken as a supplement with antioxidant benefits. Fiber salt too, as far as I know, is made from non GMO corn since it is a trade name, not a naturally occurring substance and provides a feeling of being full and maintains healthy glucose levels. Both are supplements you can buy on Amazon. That's probably why they only had to remove the word quote unquote natural because neither of those things are bad for you. So I'm, um, I don't know how you, if you know anything about those specific ingredients, but I just looked at that and I was like, that's a bunch of nonsense. There's a bunch of nonsense. There's nothing wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with things just because like nature didn't fucking provide them for you. For example, every apple you've ever eaten is grafted. Right. Apples don't like occur that way in nature. You have to create Yeah, in order to keep the same apple variety, you have to graft it onto an apple tree. So like, and I don't, I don't know. Was I off base there? Does that kind of make sense in theory? Do you know the things I was talking about specifically? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not familiar with those uh, specific compounds, um, but yeah, I, I know what you're getting at. And, and I, I agree to a certain extent. Um, yes, there are a lot of things that we th- synthesize that are not good. Um, yeah, there's some things that are either naturally occurring that you probably should be putting in your body. Um, you know, um, but at the end of the day, yeah, there's a lot like, it's just that there's such, it's like almost like it's reactionary. It's like, Mm. well, if, if it's something kind of like quote unquote synthesized, it's bad. And it's like, no, not necessarily. Like, um, like when I say as a doctrine, you know, it's a pesticide. Does that give you warm, fuzzy feelings inside? No, no. But it's all it is, is they took, so the neem tree makes, makes neem oil and they just press it right from from it's it, you know from the neem tree and then they extract the azadactrin mm. out of that which is an active ingredient that regulates uh uh pest pest growth basically, basically can regulate the uh aphids and white fly and thrips and a bunch of other common greenhouse and propagation pests um it's an organic certified product it's not it's not any worse for you than neem is it's you know, completely naturally occurring. People have used neem oil as an insect repellent for thousands of years. But, but as soon as you say pesticide or as a doctrine, people are probably like, what are you spraying on what? And it's like, dude, you can eat this stuff. It's not, it's going to do nothing. You, you can literally eat neem cake. Mm. They put it in animal feed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's totally fine. It's not going to hurt you. You know, but I don't know. It's just, it, I feel like it's the disconnect. It's gotten mm-hmm. so far mm-hmm. that not only mm-hmm. are people reacting against the things they should react to, they react against actually natural products. Yeah. So, so the, the the natives, the ancients, the traditional cultures, they never would have had to have had this this conversation. They would have just known what worked for what things, what didn't work for what things, and if something did work in a particular circumstance. Uh, was it going to be harmful in another circumstance? And then they would plan for that, right? They would say, well, this particular thing is going to help this harvest season, but we also know it's probably going to hurt the growth in the next season. So let's you, it, it's, it's the same reason people do, um, is it, I'm, I'm, I might get the word wrong, but you'll know it. it. I don't think it's sustainable farming, but when you're, when you're planting certain things in the off season that will help keep the soil nutrient rich for the next season, whatever, whatever. Uh, that you're talking about cover cropping. Say, say it again. Cover cropping. Uh, I haven't heard that term, but it, it very well might be the case. Yes. It, it's like planning, yeah, yeah. planning far ahead seasons ahead to make sure that the, the soil can. It, the, the, so get into yeah, that. There's in a, a couple, second. there's a couple concepts, but yes, one, one would be cover cropping. Another, you can say permaculture, permaculture, or, um, permaculture. There yeah. you go. That's, oh, that's the one I was, okay. that's the one I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. But where, where like th- this was understood by human beings that lived thousands of years ago, right? Thousands of years ago, because if they didn't understand it, they would die. And it's like this culture can't get it. We can't get it in our, in our heads. Like everybody is just like, well, if it's not, if it didn't descend from the tree, it's fucking bad. You're like, have you taken penicillin? Have you? Have have you had like an upper upper respiratory infection and taken amoxicillin? Oh yeah. Well, I'm fuck. Well, of course you have. Like, of course you have. Aspirin. Aspirin. (laughs) Like, are you fucking serious? Like, are you serious right now? Like, well, it's, you know, nature didn't create it. And you're like, you're like, no, but the ain't people who live thousands of years ago understood the shit that you don't understand in 2021 it frustrates the fucking shit out of me and i feel like you get that yeah and it's also how people use these things and where they come from like yeah aspirin's great but bear also mismanufactured aspirin at one point and uh you know they it could it, it, i i think i got this right there was like i want to say it was an over-the-counter pain medicine i think it was aspirin and i think it was bear where there was like some contamination with like mm. know, HIV or something in it. Well, wow. don't no, <laughs> yeah. don't call me on that one. But I, uh, it's pretty pretty bad <laughs> bad contaminant. But but I'm just saying, you know, as an if if that isn't correct, then as an example, right, um, yeah, 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 okay. things can go awry. Let's yeah. just say, um, but things can go so, awry yeah. in nature too. Oh yeah, of course. Like, I don't know if you've heard about people who like overuse essential oils and Mm. have like horrible dermatological Mm -hmm. reactions Mm -hmm. from them. It's like, 
you know, essential oils are great, but not everyone you can just slather on your body all the time mm-hmm. because it's because it's you know from nature. Um, yeah, I mean, if anybody's you know, ever uh, uh, del- delved into tea tree oil, that is not something you want to be dousing yourself in like it's an Asani yeah. water bottle, right? Like it, yeah, it has exactly. its place. And and I've also yeah. been uh, late, lately I've been um, pretty keen on kratom, and I, I've been trying out different types and and, and different you know, strains and designs. And I've, I've certainly found, uh, doses and applications where it absolutely does not work for me. And then other brands or other doses where it works very well for what, for what I'm trying to accomplish. And so it's like, you have to have continuously this connection with nature, like this trial and error, just like the ancients did, right? The only reason they know how things work is because they fucked up and people died. Right. So now in this new culture, in this materialist culture of 2021, as we move into the dim age, we're like, I, I, I'm looking at this like, OK, I'm going to try this and this didn't work and this made me feel like shit and this made me feel good. And so, yeah, this trial and error, I think, is, is kind of important. But people are so locked in their camps. Right. They're so locked and like heel driven into their side that they can't see, well, the literal forest through the trees. That's a, probably a good segue. <laughs> Oh yeah. So hold on a second. I want. I want to. I think what I was talking about was there's there was a study and I got and I got CBS News. So mm. if anyone wants to say I'm I'm quoting somebody who's not a main a mainstream cathedral source. Um, yeah, there was. I guess there was a scandal where uh, HIV blood uh, HIV contaminated blood products were were used to treat hemophiliacs mm. and thousands later died of HIV. So yeah, that's that's what I was remembering. So. Sorry, what was the last part? I just well, I, 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 I kind of like wanted to fact check myself, I, so I'm not. No, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I, I I always want this show to be seen as fact checked. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. There we mi- go. Mi- minimally it's... important to me that we uh, <laughs> fact check the show. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm actually I'm really curious, kind of uh, pivoting here. How has the last twelve to fifteen months during this COVID nightmare affected the? you know, seed business or the farming business in general, have you seen it? Have you seen the demand uh, go up, down, stay the same? And who are the people who are influencing the demand? Who are the people pushing it in one direction or the other? Okay. Well, I got, I got, yeah, that's, that's a huge thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, if we can start at the beginning of the pandemic and I can just kind of go on a timeline. Um, so like in March of last year, 2020 there was seeds seed companies were literally sold out of stuff within within weeks of like the the lockdowns in the u.s um it was like i want to say within a four-week period some of the bigger seed companies like uh i don't say bigger but um more independent bigger seed companies were like completely sold out of a lot of varieties they were totally swamped with orders um and that's where like I, I was able to fill like a huge need in the market for for you know locally adapted uh, vegetable seeds. Um, but yeah, they were complete like completely sold out. Um, I was actually for one of my jobs, I was picking up plants. Um, we were driving to like Long Island, and these were all like ornamentals, and ordering was crazy. Like they had they they kind of shut down production because they didn't know what was going to happen, and then people went crazy just trying to buy like it's not even stuff that was edible, but just like any plant material they could find. And, and nurseries had like screwy hours and weird social distance pickup things. And it was, it was such a pain. And then things kind of leveled out through the summer. And then we started seeing sh- shortages of like, kind of like, um, like industrial supplies. So like I was actually talking with one of the guys who I work with today, like, we could like, he couldn't find clamps. Like he's mm. like a woodworking guy. He couldn't find like clamps. We couldn't find like, you know, like plastic products for irrigation and stuff like that. Um, and then this kind of like was the same thing going into this fall where you have like bulb crops, um, you know, ornamental bulbs, tulips, daffodils, um, that kind of stuff, as well as garlic and edible crops all, all once again, completely sold out like stuff that usually you could find in like like you can still find sometimes like some garlic in october when you normally plant everything was sold out in like august like 
like two months beforehand. Um, same thing going into the spring this year. Uh, Fedco, Johnny's, I don't know if I should drop names here, but like a lot of the seed companies, once again, were like they had to put people on waiting lists for seeds. Like they had to really like limit, like, okay, you can only purchase, you know, t- you know, 10 packs of seeds or, or, or even like some companies would be like, okay, if you're a commercial grower and you have an account with us, you can order whatever you need first. And then home gardeners will, will only let you order like a month later. Um, and then same thing this spring too. We, ju- we just ordered a bunch of like fruit trees. Um, and this, this is a huge tell. Um, there, there's, there's several nurseries who do mature fu- uh, fruit trees in this area. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but some of these trees like take five or six years to produce them to size, um, you know, for, for a good, like two inch cal per tree with a root ball. Um, and they're completely sold out and that's t- mm-hmm. something that takes like five years to grow. So um, this is going to be a shortage that lasts, you know, probably the next few years, uh, realistically, because you can't just like, you can't grow a five-year tree in a year. So there's no way that next year they're going to have all this material back onto the market. Like it's, it's just not there. If everyone bought four-year old perennials the last two years, guess what? Like they bought three-year old perennials too. Like that, that, that stuff's not going to be on the market again for a while. Well, one of the things that makes me think about, and, and we talked about this the last time I saw you in person, um, I, I uh, drawn an analogy to dog rescue because I, I happen to be, you know, very much in tune with that community and I've rescued by rescued, I mean, I went and just bought a dog, but you know, I didn't pull him out of a burning building or anything, but it, it's, you know, the, the rescue community I think is, is, is very important to me. And, when I saw uh, the the early start of the pandemic uh, around this time last year, like April, May last year, um, all of the shelters in Southern Connecticut went bone dry. Like everyone just adopted dogs. And I went, oh, that sounds good, right? But what happens when all of these people have to go back to work and or, and, or they realize that dogs are like re- require a lot of energy and effort and time <laughs> and money, right? So I was always nervous uh, are all the dogs going to get just set loose on the street? Are they going to end up back in the shelters once all these people who could have just done a good thing before decided to fill their, you know, materialist gap in, in, in time and space? Uh, are we going to just end up right, right back where we started? And so what I was kind of saying to you when we were talking before was, do you think that what you were just talking about that, like, uh, uh, focus, in your industry during that time period, do you think that's something that will wane when people start to realize that, you know, the end of the world, the way they may have, well, the end of the world's coming, but the way they have envisioned it in their head, uh, isn't going to happen the way they thought. And like the zombie apocalypse, it's not like literally coming to like take their home and kill them that they will retrench from this. And you will see like, a um, the opposite in the industry happen. Do you think that makes sense? Does that make sense how I said it? Yeah, I I don't I don't think so. Mm. Um, the first thing I'm going to point to is that this the whole like homesteading, home gardening, eco chic, organic movement has just been building. It's been building for like mm. the last five years. Um, I, you know, it has not declined in in the market at all. Um, so I see that as like, you know, there's some, there's something we can look back on and say like, this isn't like nobody was buying organic food and then everybody, you know, the day after the pan- pandemic started, was started buying organic food. You know, this has been going on for a while. I do think some people, yeah, you know, they'll, they'll try out a garden and be like, yeah, you know, I, I couldn't keep up with it. I got busy at work or whatever. And I'm just going to go back to the same old, but I'm talking about the people I'm talking about are, are mostly farmers, um, people who have like estates who have a lot of land and a lot of money and their money's not going anywhere. So mm. they're throwing a lot of money into plant material. Um, and, and also too, um, from the food end, like, I, I, I don't know if you still see it, but you know, there, th- there is still some food shortages. Um, and there, there's, there has been talk of more drought, um, in the West and stuff like that. So, like, I don't think that stuff's going anywhere. Um, that's pretty, that's pretty long-term 
problems. And, and I feel like there's, you know, one of my big things was like, I, I've been feeling like there's been a, there's going to be a food crisis for, you know, last 10 years. I don't, I don't think that's going to be like people starving to death here, but um, I do think um, generally um, quality and availability of, of a lot of foods are going to decline. And I mean, that goes into a whole conversation about how micronutrients and interact with plants and human health, which I think is a huge issue. But um, aside from that, yeah, I, I don't, I don't necessarily think, and this is the second year too, um, where stuff has kind of opened, opened up. People are a little bit more, I guess, you know, comfortable with what's going on and that, and we're still seeing basically the same shortages. <laughs> so, I, I yeah. would love to in the future get into like the biomes, like the, the things that you were, you, you just kind of touched on it right there at the end. I don't remember the exact word that you used, but I would love to get into the actual science behind this because I think that's something that, you know, the, the people who listen to this show, it, it's a small group, but they're a dedicated heartfelt like bunch of warriors who really and, and they and they don't listen to other libertarian podcasts which is why i fucking adore good them. <laughs> why i adore them so much like there there are good libertarian podcasts don't get me wrong i listen to four or five of them and they're they're in my social circle and uh it, it will become apparent over time who those people are as we grow together but my audience does not like uh listen to me and dave smith right they just don't so uh, I think it's one of the things that would be great to talk about on another episode would be like the science behind why all of this matters, you know, and, and, okay. and, and we can't get into that now because we're going to run out of time. But what I think would be a, a good way to wrap up would be what could like the average human being who's listening to this, who really wants to take action, who really wants to promote some change and self-sufficiency in their life and not rely on you know, the local grocery store to provide them food, what would be a good avenue for them in their, you know, uh, relatively well-to-do apartment with a lot of interior and very little exterior space? What could they do to uh, grow and learn and sort of adapt some of these technologies? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to bring it back to once once again, I I am a boots on the ground solutions kind of guy. Mm. So, um, I, I, yeah, I could throw out some stuff really quick. For one thing, if you live in an apartment, some great things that you can actually grow and get involved with are mushrooms. Not a lot of space, you know, not a lot of light, you know, very, you can vertically, you can vertically integrate that. Um, just do a little digging um, on the internet. Um, uh, another thing is microgreens and sprouts. Also, same thing, not a lot of space, vertically integrate, especially in apartments and stuff like that. Um, another thing that's, that's really good is, um, cannabis. If you have a little bit more room, especially with how cannabis prices are and quality of medicinal cannabis, um, just a small, like four by four tent grow in your house, you know, get you some nice, nice medicine or, or a nice relaxing time at the very least. Um, and so there's like, those are some very simple ways that like, you don't have to spend a ton of money. I mean, probably the, the least expensive would be like something like mushrooms and microgreens got a little bit more money, got like 500 bucks, 600 bucks kicking around, you know, then you want to, you want to grow yourself some nice flour. You can do that. Um, and, and that's, that's a good way to start. Another way is like, you know, find a local farm, buy from them. Um, you know, that's always, it's always a great way to go. Um, I, I have a, quite a bit of ambition to do multiple shows on cannabis in the future. And, and also on um, uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms, because th- that that's aside from the – I'm going to do a bunch of episodes on all of that kind of stuff. The, the cannabis specifically because uh, I've been working with some people here in Connecticut to develop some white-labeled products here for the show. And uh, some of that would be CBD and some of it would be cannabis uh, THC-specific, but also the fact that um, I've done – three ayahuasca experiences. I've done a lot of acid tripping. I've, I've taken a lot of mushrooms. I think a lot of that is, is worthy of, of many episodes worth of discussion because it, it, it opens your mind up and it, it, it frees you if you're doing it properly, right? If you're doing it in a controlled setting 
almost like a, like a medicinal setting with the right people who are working you through your journey or is getting you to a good place. Um, but one of the things that popped out there to me was um, I was thinking, could, could people who are living in a, an urban setting or in apartment complexes, the, the way you were talking, how could they use something like aquaponics to achieve something like this? So uh, that's, that's going to be, more, that's, that's, uh, that's a hard one because you're, you're working with more systems. There's more stuff going on because now you have to add water. You have to add pumps. I mean, not to say the other things don't have water, but now you have to have, add like large volumes of standing water. Mm. You have to have some way to aerate it. You have to have some way to clean this pump it. Um, you have to care for the fish you have to care for if you're doing, you know, aquaponics is, you know, fish and plant material. So now it, it, it's it, it's a lot of moving parts. And for somebody in an apartment, it's one thing to be like, oh, I have like two 10 by 20 trays of microgreens harvested. And now what do I do with the soil or media that's left in them? Okay, I can compost this. Okay, what do I do with this 20 gallon, <laughs> 20 gallons of water in this fish tank? Like, how do I go? Oh, I have to pump <laughs> this into my bathtub. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Like it, it's logistics. Um and, 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 you know, it, it, that just gets hard. Um, yeah. So I, I don't, I can't really speak to that end, but I can speak to the simpler things and herbs too. Like you can always throw some herbs in your window and, and like, I'm not saying these things, you know, are going to like, you know, overthrow the state or we're all going to be like super self-sufficient tomorrow. But, you know, at least if you grow some basil plants in your window, you have an idea of how a plant <laughs> yes, grows yes, yes. and what and what green things yes. look like and, and how they taste. <laughs> and like, you know, let's at least start with the basics. Um, and, and at the end of the day, I don't I don't give a fuck about overthrowing the state. I, I you know, I, I well, don't yeah. I don't really think any of us do. Yeah. Re really, what it all comes down to is going and creating our own society, our own culture of like-minded people who want to be self-sustainable and live peacefully and, and work within our own ideology. And it doesn't matter what you look like, who you love, who you fuck, what's between your legs. It, it matters that people are working together to create something new and evolving out of the need for a state. I, I, let me say it this way, evolving out of the need for this state will create within that community a better hierarchy of needs that contributes to individual liberty and economic freedom in actuality rather than just this fucking nonsense that we're living through. So anything, yeah, exactly. we, any, anything we didn't touch on you think is important to bring up? And uh, if so, feel free. If not, let people know where they can check out your podcast and where they can buy your products because – it's very, very important that people, especially locally here in Southern Connecticut, because Corey is here in Connecticut, uh, support you and and make sure that they're sharing what you're doing with their loved ones and their friends. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I have too much stuff to touch on, so I'll just drop my plugs. <laughs> oh. What? Do, do what you want, man. I got nothing but time. Whatever you want. Whatever you no, want. No, no, no. Just joking. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, you can find me on Instagram at Focus Seeds. Focus is spelled P-H-O-C-A-S. Um, you can also check out my website, focusseeds.com. Um, and I'm, I have a podcast, Focus Seedcast. Um, it's more industry stuff. I deal with um, a lot of plant, like, yeah, plant breeding, seed saving, and uh, the cannabis industry. Talk to a lot of you know friends and, and uh, colleagues of mine. So it's more industry related, but some people might have some some interest in that. I do have episodes on some intro stuff. I did, I dropped an episode on how to save seeds and I'm going to be doing a soils episode soon. Um, but yeah, other than that, like just get out there and grow some plants and take a hike or, you know, get, you know, get out of this craziness. Dude, dude, there's nothing better than people who are liberty minded, who are going out and creating or helping to create or sharing with other people, the world, that they want to live in. And that's why I wanted to have this conversation. And I think you fucking nailed it. I, I very much appreciate your time. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you. All right, everybody. That's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Corey from Focus Seeds for coming on and having this conversation with me. That's focusseeds.com, P-H-O-C-U-S, seeds.com, and the Focus Seeds podcast. 
I appreciate you listening. I appreciate his time. I appreciate your time. Please go ahead and continue to leave five-star rating and reviews on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. But for now, that's it. Be safe. Be well. I'll talk to you soon.